also for recording purposes, Friday, um, May 16th, 10 o'clock at night, Israel time. And that's important because we talk about things that tomorrow could, could be irrelevant. Or if you want to go back and test and see what we said at this time, uh, things are very dynamic always in the Middle East, especially at a time like this. Um, I just want to make a few points of emphasis. Um, the first is that I was not called in for my reserve duty. So everything I say is just me, it's just my own personal opinion and my perspective on what's going on. Um, and that's very important because I am not exposed to classified information, which means I can't share anything. And sometimes Israelis here pick up something here and there, they're concerned that maybe this should not have been said, but since it's all from the media, all on my, my personal assessment, there's no concern here. I think you all know me or most of you know me, so I'm not gonna take the time to introduce myself. Sorry if someone doesn't know me, uh, then you'll find me online later. I'm letting in another Sarah. Um, and we're gonna be talking about the situation in Israel now. Interesting, um, I, I think I already used the term war. Uh, I'm not sure I know what to call it. You know, in Israel since the 2006 um, campaign in Lebanon, we're very sensitive to terminology because we understand the importance of, of coining the right term for what we're uh, experiencing. Is this a war right now? Uh, probably not, an operation. Uh, but certainly is, you could say Israel is always at war. Uh, but right now it is a campaign. We are doing fighting. And it's also more than one arena. We are challenged with multiple arenas. And we'll try to cover them uh, uh, the best we can. I do want to start by saying that people are dying. People are dying. I mean, of course, some smiles here. I'm, I'm happy to see some friends and family. And we always have to keep high spirits, but uh, innocent people are dying. 10 Israelis died so far this week from rockets. Uh, about 200 were wounded, various levels uh, associated with the rockets. Um, and innocent people in Gaza are dying, civilians. And we as Israelis certainly have to always remember that because innocent civilians that harmed no one are certainly dying because war is uh, chaotic, uh, war is difficult. And when you fight a terror organization that they don't care about their own civilians and they use their civilians as human shields or fire rockets from within civilian compounds, making them a legitimate military target when ultimately these targets are attacked and then we get what we call collateral damage, that is tragic. Also, of course, remember that many Gazans these days are dying because of uh, directly Hamas fire because they are firing actually homemade rockets or locally made rockets and about 20% of them fail. That's, that's a huge amount. When I mean fail, I mean they, they, uh, they hit short of the border, they hit residential areas, some of them explode on the launch, launching pad and since these launching pads are within civilian population in houses and schools and mosques and hospitals, every such uh, accident, you could call it, is a tragedy uh, and then civilians die. Remember that Hamas as a terror organization adhere to no laws, to no, no norms, certainly no moral values or codes that we uh, are used to thinking as, as a basic fundamental issue of going to war. And since they don't adhere to any of these, um, they can do anything they want also in warfare, but also simply by lying. I find it very interesting as an Israeli that sometimes uh, we see a terror organization, they'll do anything, horrific, horrific uh, things that, of course, a terror organization does, but then they say something, and for some reason, the world thinks that, well, if they said it, it must be right. No, we terrorists, they can kill, they can murder, they can, they can do these devastating things to civilians, no moral code, but they don't lie. So even numbers of death, the death toll in Gaza, everything has to be taken into consideration that it is a terror organization issuing these messages. So that's... And remember that we're talking about narratives. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a clash, it's a battle on the ground, but it's also a battle of narratives, uh, which means that of course they will have theirs, we will have ours. And even when I say we, I myself argue with my colleagues and friends all the time about uh, the way we perceive things. So everything I say to this evening, uh, this could be my perspective, but uh, 
another retired colonel just like me, or even better than me, that came from the intelligence corps, he could say, no, my assessment is totally different than yours. And again, it's all, it's all this one big package. So after saying all that, um, let's talk a little about how we got here. I think the Americans call this road to war and exercises, like what led to the point we are at now? Only one week ago, seems like, um, seems like, like a long time. Um, and also here, we can argue about the, the facts and what these facts mean. Remember that just about a week ago, we had Ram the month of Ramadan and the, and the holidays of Ramadan coinciding with Israel's Jerusalem Day, an official holiday in Israel. And uh, all these things came uh, together on the Temple Mount or Al-Aqsa Mosque, as the Muslims call it. Uh, around the same time, we're dealing with a uh, civil dispute being dealt with Israeli courts these days with a few apartments in Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood in Jerusalem. And also this, see how it's blown out of proportion and taken to a narrative as if Israel is taking over uh, homes, as if there's some secret campaign to, to occupy uh, buildings within a, an Arab neighborhood in East Jerusalem, when in fact this is only a civil dispute, will be decided by courts. Uh, and by the way, we can just take care of it right now by assuming and hoping that the Israeli government will find a creative solution, for instance, by nationalizing these apartments, compensating the, the legal owners that are probably Jewish, and putting this behind us. But I'll say already here that our enemies always seek these excuses, and they blow them out of proportion to use it for their, for their goals. We see it everywhere. Take Lebanon, for instance. We have like the famous Shaba farms that Hezbollah for years clings to these little excuses in order to launch uh, attacks and actually justify their actions. So in Jerusalem, it was this clash around the, the dispute in the apartments, what was going on on the Temple Mount. Um, and uh, um, we've seen this many years that around Ramadan, there's a narrative that goes out, save Al-Aqsa Mosque from the Jews, from the infidels. And when you tell Muslims around the world that Al-Aqsa Mosque is, is at risk, it's being threatened by the Jews, this garners a lot of support, a lot of emotion, and it worked here again. Uh, worshippers inside uh, amassed piles of stones and they piled up uh, furniture and ultimately Israeli police broke in. Um, so again, depends who you listen to. One will tell you that Israeli police stormed the mosque for no reason. In fact, and since my brother once did it himself as a police officer, I, uh, I know from the ground that what happens is that when riot police need to go in to disperse a riot, then it looks bad. But bottom line, just to, to wrap up this thing of the, of the, uh, the mosque, um, the Temple Mount and Al-Aqsa Mosque, um, one second, I'm just checking, okay. The mosque is not threatened, never was threatened. And remember, we reconquered uh, Jerusalem, reunited Jerusalem. And even though, of course, we have a very strong religious and emotional connection to this very site where the Holy Temple stood, there is no secret plan to reestablish the third temple, I assure you. And I say this, it's not a joke, because many people believe it. There is no threat to Al-Aqsa Mosque, a very important, critical component of Israel's uh, perception of this whole this whole area is freedom of worship and there's a mosque there and the Muslims respect it and worship there and it's important for us to maintain it and by the way as we speak they they pray there and during the riots now as we speak during the war with Gaza tens of thousands of Palestinians went up to the mosque and prayed there in peace and I hope it always remains so but remember next year in Ramadan and the years after that when you hear Al-Aqsa Mosque is being threatened by the Jews, remember what I said. Um, it turns out only in the last few days, I heard, I don't know the intelligence myself, I heard through various uh, media outlets that the Israeli intelligence had information that Hamas was planning to fire rockets at Jerusalem. The Israeli military actually warned the government that this was being planned, that Hamas had an interest to fire rockets at Jerusalem. And so the big question is what was what to do and when to do it, and if, for instance, to allow a certain parade of uh, Jewish uh, uh, youth to parade with flags through the old city of Jerusalem. And this whole debate was always, you know, it always is 
you know, how much should we calm the situation or how much should we do what we plan to do anyway? Decisions were made. One thing I will tell you, because I am no spokesperson, I will never say that all the decisions that were made were true or they were correct. First, because we are human beings and we make mistakes and leaders make mistakes. And if we go and review what happened, maybe we could have an opinion that this could have been done differently. Maybe there we could have been a little more sensitive, all possible. But it's my assessment right now that the way things unfolded now were inevitable, probably because Hamas had an interest to trigger this. Um, right after that, uh, violent riots broke out. Of course, Israel retaliated like we always do. Um, they fire rockets, a terror organization fires rockets raining down on our capital. So of course we retaliate and then we find ourselves where we are now a few days later. At the same time, riots broke out in mixed Jewish Arab uh, cities throughout Israel. Um, very troubling, devastating, serious riots. And for, for, for Jews, this really brings back uh, historic memories of, of pogroms and riots where homes and stores and synagogues are ransacked and burned to the ground. Frightening, troubling, and if you ask me, we could spend a whole evening talking, talking about that as a strategic uh, challenge or threat for Israel, much more than a terror organization that fires rockets. But it's important for me to say this because our internal challenges with Arab Israelis, the, the, the fabric of the Israeli society and how we move forward is critical for us. We'll have to figure this out. We will have to see the process of healing, not easy. Uh, national religious sentiments came up surfaced. And of course, even if 1% rioted or 5% rioted, and most Arabs certainly had nothing to do with it, this, this does bring to the surface deep emotions, um, issues that have to do with Israeli legislation, even things that have to do with national aspirations. Remember what we call Israeli Arabs or 20% of Israel, equal citizens, just like, just like me. Uh, but still, many of them call themselves Palestinian Arabs. They have roots, they have family, they have also their own narratives and aspirations. And these are strategic issues we will have to address. And also here, you'll never hear me say that Israel was perfect. We never did anything wrong. What do they want? Very troubling. But I'm sorry to bunch these things together. Whoever has grievances has to express them has to, break, has to discuss them in a democratic way. You can't express grievances with violence. So we all have to agree that violence is negative and certainly terror organizations, they also have political goals, right? They have political aspirations. Hamas, we know what their goals are, to wipe us off, out, off the map. They say so, they have it in their charter. That's what they want to achieve. And in a way we have to respect it that that's what they want, but they use terror to achieve their goal and terror is wrong. Anyway, the main question here I would ask is, could this all have been avoided? And I answered you, I don't know. I don't think so. Because Hamas had an interest, and we'll get to this in a few minutes. By the way, I should, I should have said, I see a quiet audience, all muted. That's nice. But if I say something you don't understand, if I say something you really think is wrong, factually wrong, this is Israel. I'm in Israel. Speak up. Just unmute. Tell me what you think, and we can immediately turn it into a discussion. It's really fine. A quick, um, a quick look before we go into Gaza, a quick look at what's happening around us, because really what's happening these days, it sounds like one of is Israelis' uh, regular strategic overviews. When we talk about we are surrounded with challenges and enemies, and it's true. As we speak, fighting in Gaza, I told you about the internal unrest and riots in cities. We have Bedouins in the south. Also another strategic problem of Israel, of a really ungoverned area in a way. We have in Lebanon, of course, Hezbollah, the terror organization, um, and the, was quiet for a few days, but then we had a penetration of the fence with a few people that actually crossed into Israel. Israeli soldiers told them to go back. They wouldn't, they fired in the air. Ultimately, they did shoot toward, towards these people and one of them was killed. And, um, uh, very troubling, of course, for us, because this could erupt into a northern arena. And of course, and Israel's policy has always been, you know, to bring peace and calm and quiet and contain. And certainly Israel has 
no interest to have any escalation on northern border, which is why it's very sensitive, done, of course, together with uh, close dialogue with uh, UNIFIL forces there, and uh, that, of course, talked to Lebanese armed forces to de-escalate the situation. We also had rockets, two rockets come in from Lebanon, but they hit the, hit the ocean, the Mediterranean. So again, monitoring this very closely and hoping that that stays the way it is. And I, mo I think most of us believe that these are just Palestinian factions trying to show their allegiance or support for their brothers in Gaza or something like that. Even Hezbollah's response so far, their rhetoric was very uh, relaxed or relatively relaxed to what we know. They did not come out saying, we're going to avenge the death of this uh, person that was killed. So hopefully that is contained. We had rockets coming in from Syria to, this, to the Golan Heights. So from the Syrian Golan Heights to the Israeli Golan Heights. Also a very pinpoint issue that we hope uh, is contained. Jordan, we had two uh, Jordanians that were caught in Israel with knives on the way to Jerusalem. Who knows what they were planning to do? Not good stuff, probably. So you see all these... Uh, all these areas that we have to always monitor and see that nothing erupts there and hope that it's local. The really problematic arena right now for us is Judea and Samaria, or what you may call the West Bank, or some others may call the occupied territory. I won't. So in Judea and Samaria, we have um, uh, riots. I was going to say unrest, but it's more, it's more riots. Several Palestinians were killed in clashing with IDF soldiers. Uh, several terror attacks, including today we had a ramming attack, which means someone took his car and just drove into a bunch of police officers and wounded about seven of them. And these things are building up, and this is very serious. Now here, this brings me to an important point that um, I believe many do not understand. If you see a bunch of people rioting somewhere now as the war in Gaza goes on, one second, I'm going to admit people. If you see some rally and people are chanting pro-Palestinian messages because of the war in Gaza, free Palestine, people believe that right now what, what we have is a war between Israel and Palestine. Remember, there is no such state Palestine, but there is the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank and a terror organization that rules the Gaza Strip in the south, two separate entities. And the hist simple history there is the Palestinian Authority was established from the Oslo Accords somewhere in the 90s. The Fatah organization, the relatively modest Fatah organization, rules the Palestinian Authority. Israel has very close collaboration with them, cooperation, dialogues on a, an array of issues from water desalination to security, of course. Um, of course, the road to peace is far. Uh, huge differences between the sides. It's not like we're great friends, but certainly working from the Oslo Accords until today, technically working on the ground together, trying to establish mechanisms of coexistence and, and dreaming of a future of peace. But the Gaza Strip in 2007, Hamas, the terror organization, took over by force from Fatah. And when I say by force, I mean they shot them in the kneecaps, threw them off rooftops, brutal, brutal takeover of the Gaza Strip. And since then, this terror organization, Hamas, that's actually a forward operating base of Iran, it's, it's a proxy of Iran, funded and trained by Iran. So they rule this enclave and they are mortal enemies of Fatah, enemies. Many people think, you know, it's Palestinians, Israelis, uh, think again, it's much more complicated th than that. So everything that's happening the last few days or a lot of what's happening in the last few days is Hamas trying to establish its dominance, its relevance, to be perceived as the protector of Jerusalem. Remember, that's how it started. They gave us an ultimatum. A terror organization in some small sand enclave in southern Israel gave Israel an ultimatum that, of course, was totally ridiculous, like uh, stop dealing with houses, uh, uh, leave Temple Mount, uh, or else we will shoot at 6 o'clock at night. And they did. And as I told you, that's what they plan to do anyway. And they do, they do these things, I believe, for also wishing to be perceived as the great defenders of Jerusalem by the Palestinians and the entire world. We were supposed to, we were on the way to elections in the Palestinian Authority, and they were probably going to win. That means the terror organization Hamas was probably going to take over the leadership of the entire Palestinian people. Mahmoud Abbas, the Palestinian Authority president or chairman, 
canceled the elections. We haven't had elections in a long time. That's far from being a democratic body. He canceled it in fear that they will take over. And here, this plays into all of their calculations to be perceived as the leaders of the Palestinians. In a way, I want to say this carefully, if I have to find some achievement that Hamas have in the last week, it, maybe it's that. It's that they strengthen their position within the Palestinian people as uh, the entity that stands up to the Israelis, that dares to fire rockets at the Israelis, and is perceived as the the bearer of the flag of uh, the Mukawama, the, the resistance, the fight, the struggle against the, the Zionists in pursuit of their ultimate goal of annihilating Israel. By the way, when an Israeli says that Hamas planned to annihilate Israel, it sounds a little like propaganda. It's not, it's just their charter, it's what they write, it's what they say, it's what they want to do. I would not say that about other organizations. I would not even say that about Fatah right now, because again, I think, I think here, uh, moderates can understand that we have a positive path in the future. Hamas, there is no positive uh, path. And this also means that any discussion we may have now between Westerners, I could call it, or Western values or Western way of thought, that's always like, how can we resolve this? So maybe we can um, uh, improve the economic situation in Gaza and give them incentives or give them something to lose. Most of that talk is irrelevant when you're talking about a terror organization that they're goals are a thousand year, years into the future or a hundred years into, they don't care, they have the patience. Remember that many times when we talk about them, we in a way are condescending or we don't respect enough the fact that they are no less resilient and resolved like we are. We waited 2000 years to come back to Israel. They have very powerful sentiments. They also say we are gonna fight to the death and we are going to take back this land and establish one Muslim entity from the river to the sea. You're gone. You're not your visitors here, your invaders, your infidels, you're out. So how do you, so, so if you have an interesting debate about establishing a seaport in Gaza, I'm not sure that economic uh, uh, success is what they're seeking. So, um, Going to okay, so now to the now to the to this round in Gaza. When I say round, it's it's what we call it because we have every few years we have these rounds we had in 2009. By the way, we call it fancy names. I'm not even going to use it because it translates to a different name. So we had the 2009 conflict, the 2012, the 2014, and what it is really is if you ask me what the Israeli policy is, I'm not sure there is a policy, but you can understand the policy from what we do. We let it build up. We try to maintain the calm, we try to contain, they build up their force or Iran helps them build up their force. And then once in a while, when they have a miscalculation or if they do it like now calculated, but the miscalculation is that they did not expect it to be so bad. Okay, remember this point, just like Hezbollah in 2006, clearly admitted if we had known that this would be Israel's response, we would not have launched this. It could be that we're going to the same scenario now that Hamas wanted this, this, they needed this, but they had no idea how bad it was going to be. It could be that that's it, that's it. So then we go in, they fire the rockets. We try to take out the rockets. We don't succeed to take out the rockets. And remember, this is an important point. I get asked this a lot. How come if you're so powerful and you're so successful, they keep raining down these barrages of rockets throughout Israel. It's incredible. And by the way, it is incredible. I stood on my porch last night, midnight, rockets raining down. I could see it from Tel Aviv all the, down, all the way down south to Ashdod. Unbelievable strategic capability of a terror organization to launch a barrage of rockets. They fired until now 3, 000, more than 3,000 long-range rockets. Really unbelievable. And the answer to this is we can't because they're buried, they're hidden, as I said, in schools and mosques underground. So most of what we're doing now is not to, to negate capabilities of firing right now. It's more to take care of strategic assets. And I'll just talk a few, a little about what we're doing. It's taking out, when I mean taking out, that means destroying, eliminating, uh, taking away a capability that could have materialized now, could have materialized next year or next confrontation. Some of these capabilities we don't even know that existed because our intelligence knew and now we destroyed it and we'll never know. Some we hear, for instance, um, 
uh, a bunch of submarines with 50 kilograms of uh, explosives that were supposed to go to our oil rigs and, and, ex and explode, detonate there. Should have been a devastating strategic blow. We took out most of that capabilities, of that capability. We heard a lot about the campaign that we had Thursday night or the, the deception that came before the operation to take out the underground tunnels. And you have to understand the importance of this because Hamas for years is building an underground uh, and city uh, interlinked of tunnels, command posts, weapons, all underground in Gaza. And it helps them when we invade or when we, when we come in, when we have what we call the ground maneuver of soldiers on the ground, boots on the ground, they can actually run from tunnel to tunnel, from house to house without being seen, come out, hit us and hide again. And this, this underground warfare that wasn't invented in Gaza, of course, uh, we know this in warfare for a long time, but they perfected this. They pour millions of dollars, of course, that come from your tax, uh, tax dollars and EU assistance and UN organizations, et cetera. Millions of dollars are poured underground to these amazing elaborate underground systems. And this operation was meant to take out that uh, infrastructure. Many kilometers were actually destroyed, collapsed, which means we took away from them a strategic asset that was supposed to be used in the next war, or, or if we, if, if we uh, launch uh, a ground maneuver this time. Um, it is said that the IDF planned to have many of the operatives or the terrorists go underground and we were supposed to take out hundreds of them, and that maybe this specific move was not as successful as we thought, I don't know, soon to tell, remember that even if 200 Hamas terrorists died underground, first, we, don't, we won't necessarily know it now. And second, we may never know because they, won't, they never come out and say, yeah, we lost 200 of our operatives, we died underground, IDF wins. Never gonna happen. Remember a battle of narratives, terror organization. They will never admit that. Um, they may um, um, attribute them to other causes. They may just hide the numbers, whatever. Oh, and maybe we were not as successful as we thought in this specific operation, I do not know. I'm coming to an end of my opening remarks uh, and then I'll open it up for questions. I just wanna, I wrote down a few questions that I think are good questions and I'll try to answer them. First, the issue of military targets. We saw that Israel targeted um, um, a residential tower yesterday. It looks like, res looks like a residential tower. It even housed the headquarters of uh, AP, Associated Press, and Al Jazeera. This, uh, this building was toppled in the usual manner like the IDF always does. If you don't know, this means calling the build building manager, evacuating, it, evacuating everybody, pleading with them to make sure that every single last person left the building. And after that, firing a small uh, non-lethal ordinance on the roof and only after that, and with surveillance uh, imagery and everything, when we make sure that no one's there and no one's in the surrounding area, a pinpoint strike that topples the building. This is what we usually do with our military targets. You may ask, if they are military uh, assets inside and maybe many terrorists, why don't we topple these buildings with their inhabitants? Well, with the AP building and Al Jazeera, I'm sure you know that's not, we would never do such a thing, but we never do such a thing in most of our targets unless it's a specific terrorist target where we're trying to eliminate a terrorist, even these headquarters, these bunkers, we usually warn them in advance to make sure that everyone leaves and that even civilians in the surroundings move away to make the death toll as minimal as possible so we don't kill even one civilian that should not get hurt. Uh, and we take extreme measures, even in the last few days, I don't know if you saw videos, it could be bombs away. And then you hear in Hebrew, of course, you hear, I see children in the area abort, and we actually abort, take the missiles away, they explode in an open area and we miss the target because it's very important for us not to, not to hit uh, what we call non-combatants. Um, interesting question about the AP building is, why did we do it? Simply because they were terror assets inside. I can't tell you who know, knew what, but we knew what was in there. R&D for Hamas, that means improving all their weaponry and, and, and rockets intelligence apparatus, et cetera, which means certain, no, no question about it, a legal military target that should, could have been taken out in war. A question that you may ask, and I don't have an answer is, how much did Israel weigh the criticism we will get afterwards from AP? Because 
you know, sir, looks bad. You take out a building with media in it. And did they really have the exact calculation of the military gain compared to the criticism we will get? And that's a good question. I don't know what they weighed and what their, uh, what their uh, answer was, but certainly there's no question about the legality of this target. And this is a, really a trademark of the way we fight in Gaza. It's that all targets are military targets only. And by the way, sometimes we as Israelis hear on the news, I'm smiling, I'm sorry, but here on the news, a report saying the IDF uh, struck a civilian building today. Uh, I call my friends um, at the station. I said, where did that come from? They said, you know, we didn't get any reports from the IDF today, but that came out on the website of Hamas. Said, okay, so of course Hamas will say we struck a residential area. 99%, I'll tell you, these are not, even if it's a house, that means it's a house of a terror operative that was used as a headquarters. The whole basement is a bunker and a headquarters for terrorist activity. And we have lawyers sitting with us on every single meeting and approving every single target. Uh, I will point out that it's quite unbelievable, this quiet audience that doesn't stop me even once for a comment or a question. So um, either you all left or you're just very patient. Uh, soon winding down to an end. Important question, how successful was this operation? I'm pausing to admit a few others. How successful was the operation? Soon to tell, and a fascinating phenomenon for me is that we Israelis are not sure, argue about it. I have colleagues that think, ah, it's more of the same. Uh, the IDF say that it is, um, significantly greater success or military achievement than in previous campaigns. From everything that I see, from everything that I hear, I believe that the IDF demonstrated what they have been working on for years. That means perfecting this machine of a list of, of targets, having of course the right goals of the operation and then going and taking them out as fast as possible. And you can see even that what took us many, many days in 2014, I think it was maybe almost 50 days, 50, the, the whole campaign, and only towards the end, we were taking out these high value targets. Here from day one, the IDF was striking hard on high value targets. And it seems to me that the achievements on the ground are overwhelming. Remember, there is no such thing as victory. No Hamas operative is going to come out with a white flag. More than that, when we finally do have a ceasefire, maybe may be brokered by uh, United Nations Security Council resolution or something, there will be no right flag and there will be rockets at the last minute and they will fire last. They're always working on the narrative of we stood strong and we won. But I believe looking at the results so far from the tunnels to the other capabilities that I told you that we took out to the devastation of the terror infrastructure, actually the capabilities that we took away from them that we will not meet ever or at least not meet in the next few years, I think it's safe to say that this is a great success from that perspective.